Our conversations with former employees, business partners, and an extensive document review show that the company's orders are largely fictitious and used as a prop to raise capital and confer legitimacy. Hey, I'm Stephen, and this is Solving the Money Problem. If you're new, welcome. If you're not, welcome back. So strap yourselves in, ladies and gentlemen. Today, we are looking at Nikola Motor Corporation Part 2, also known as Lordstown Motors. Now, for those of you that don't know, close to a year ago, I began publishing a series of videos asking a lot of questions about Nikola, suggesting that the company appeared a little bit suspect. I was seeing a huge number of red flags about the company from its founder, their claims, their technology, everything about the company smelled bad. And just a few months later, short selling firm Hindenburg Research published a scathing report, effectively accusing Nikola of being a company built upon a web of lies, misleading of investors, deception, and in less politically correct terms, a pile of horse shit everywhere you look. Well, guess what? Now it's round two, this time with Lordstown Motors. Again, Hindenburg Research have done a lot of the heavy lifting, done a lot of digging, and I'm going to be reading through some of their accusations and allegations and apparent findings. And these are all allegations, not even my own personal opinions, so please do your own research, blah, fucking blah, blah, blah. So with that said, let's get into it. And guys, the reason I'm creating this video for you today is not necessarily to warn people out of this company, don't buy the stock, blah, blah, blah. I don't care about that. Do whatever you want with your money. I literally don't care. What I'm doing today is hopefully going to give you guys some indications and clues for how to spot suspicious companies in the future. There's going to be an absolute tsunami of EV SPACs IPOing in the next year or two. Why? Because there is literally hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of more Ronic investors desperately chasing after the next Tesla because they feel like they missed out on the opportunity in Tesla because they didn't buy Tesla stock in 2019 or earlier. Oh, excuse me, guys. Got a call coming in. Uh, hello, hello. Oh, hey, 2031. How are you doing? Oh, you got a message from my viewers? And what's that? Oh, you want me to tell them that it's still early and they didn't actually miss out on Tesla yet. But they're too probably too dumb to realize that because they think the stock's expensive today because they don't have any perspective and they don't understand how much more value this company... Oh, okay, yeah, cool. No problem. All right, um, yeah, that was the future calling saying uh, you probably haven't missed out on Tesla, but hey, you do you if you want to chase after the next opportunity. Go for your life. But please, don't be a moron. Don't throw good money at a bad idea or a company with too many red flags unless you're willing to lose it all. Now, I'm not suggesting that every EV SPAC that ever gets announced from here out into the future is a scam, is illegitimate, will fail, etc. But I do want to make something super clear before we dive into this report. Reaching volume production with any new electric vehicle, as in hundreds of thousands of units per year, is an excruciatingly difficult task. Tesla made it look relatively easy despite the fact that the company almost died a couple of times along the way. And that was looking easy. So just imagine how difficult it's going to be for all of these other companies attempting to compete with Elon Musk's brain, Elon Musk's army of engineers, the lead that Tesla has, the technological advantages, the scale, the manufacture, everything, right? Good luck competing with Tesla. That's the moral of the story. So when you hear people making audacious claims, suggesting they've got lots of pre-orders, they've got great technology, blah, 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 be very skeptical. Even more so than that, when you hear people making claims that they'll soon be building these vehicles, they're getting from prototype stage to production vehicles to volume production right around the corner, red flags for days. That's not to say some of these companies won't be successful in ramping to volume production. That is to say that it will be extraordinarily difficult to do so. So take everything these new EV SPAC startups say with a gigantic, colossal Mount Everest, no, Olympus Mons sized grain of salt. So. Fire up your bullshit detectors and let's get into the video. But first, hey guys, if you'd like to help out the channel and get up to two free stocks, check out the link in the description to Webull. If you open a new account, you'll get one free stock valued up to $250 just for opening an account. And if you fund your account with $100, you'll get a second free stock valued up to $1,600. Unless you don't like free stocks, that is. And if you're in Australia, the UK, or New Zealand, you can get a free stock with stake also using the link in the description. Let's get back to it. Here we are, boys and girls. The Lordstown Motors Mirage. Fake orders, undisclosed production hurdles, and a prototype inferno. Lordstown is an electric vehicle SPAC with no revenue and no sellable product, sounds familiar, which we believe has misled investors on both its demand and production capabilities. Boy, this is sounding real familiar. The company has consistently pointed to its book of 100,000 pre-orders as proof of deep demand for its proposed EV truck. Our conversations with former employees, business partners, and an extensive document review show that the company's orders are largely fictitious and used as a prop to raise capital and confer legitimacy. Now, again, I'm not making accusations here, but 
If I wanted to scam people and dumb investors out of literally hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars, you know how I'd do it? I'd get some computer whiz to whip up a few mock-ups of a cool looking truck, a cool looking product. Then I'd go and sell some completely non-buying pre-orders to a bunch of my friends and family and anyone I could possibly convince to take on one of these non-binding pre-orders. Then I'd go to extraordinarily dumb investors and or companies like General Motors, shout out to the Nikola Badger partnership and go, hey guys, would you like to pre-order? Would you like to buy? Would you like to invest? Would you like to do something? Because look at all these pre-orders. We're amazing. Please give us your money. Next minute, a bunch of idiots give this company some money. They IPO through a SPAC. Then insiders begin selling shares before they've produced a single product, a single dollar of revenue. And then I would disappear into the wilderness in about five or six years when everyone sort of thought, oh, well, it's not their fault. It was just really hard to get to production. But seriously, though, guys, this is exactly how things will play out. Mark my fucking words. Over the next few years, there will be literally dozens upon dozens of these new EV startups IPOing through SPACs before they have any revenue, any products, anything to show for their efforts. They're in, but nothing, right? Just a bunch of fucking la 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 promises, ideas, hopes and dreams, nothing tangible, no products on roads, nothing. And then here's how things play out. Well, we'll be in volume production in 12 months time, six months later. Uh, make that 18 months time, six months later. Oh, there's been a slight delay. We've redesigned this. We've changed this, blah, 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 blah. Production's really hard. Five years later, they're out of business, bankrupt, acquired or merged. And of course, the early investors, well, they're sh out of luck, but good thing a lot of insiders sold stock early soon after the IPO before they delivered any products to customers, right? That's the modus operandi. Mark my words, this is exactly how things are going to play out. There will be dozens of these stories playing out over the next few years. Watch. For example, Lordstown recently announced a 14,000 truck deal from E Squared Energy, supposedly representing $735 million in sales. E Squared is based out of a small residential apartment in Texas that doesn't operate a vehicle fleet. Major red flag. Another 1,000 truck, $52.5 million order comes from a two-person startup that operates out of a Regis virtual office with a mailing address at a UPS store. We spoke with the owner who acknowledges it won't actually order any vehicles, instead describing the pre-order as a mere marketing relationship. Lordstown CEO Steve Burns has called these arrangements very serious orders. The actual customer agreements, which we present for the first time today, require no deposit and are non-binding. Many of the supposed customers do not operate fleets, nor do many have the means to actually make the stated purchases. Again, gigantic f***ing red flag. Former employees and litigation records reveal that in order to raise capital and confer credibility, Steve Burns began paying consultants for every truck pre-order as early as 2016 while he was serving as CEO of Workhorse. For those of you who don't know, Steve left Workhorse, founded Lordstown and is licensing their technology to build a pickup truck. Later, Heading into Lordstown's eventual go public transaction in 2020, a small consulting group called Climb to Glory was paid to generate pre-orders. Multiple former senior employees who have worked with Lordstown founder and CEO Steve Burns openly described him as a con man or a P.T. Barnum figure. That's <laughs> fuck. Oh my God. Shout out to Trevor Milton. Oh my God. This is just hilarious. One senior employee told us that, while working with Steve for a couple of years, they saw more questionable and unethical business practices than they had seen in their entire career. Despite claims that Lordstown will be producing vehicles by September, a former employee explained how the company is experiencing delays and making drastic design modifications, putting them an estimated three to four years away from production. For example, in mid-January, the company totally switched from a plastic exterior to aluminium. Despite claims that battery packs would be manufactured in-house, we were told that the equipment is months away from arriving, let alone being put into a production environment. Former employees also shared that the company has completed none of its needed testing or validation, including cold weather testing, durability testing, and the Federal Motor Vehicle Safety Standards testing required by NHTSA. In January 2021, Lordstown's first street road test resulted in the vehicle bursting into flames 10 minutes into the test drive. Now, just for the record, I don't want to shit on this company too much. Like, you can have accidents. That's not a problem. This is really just giving you context from how far away these Muppets are from actually having production-ready vehicles if the first time they put one of their prototypes on the road, it self-immolates. 
Lordstown only went public in October 2020, but in that brief time, executives and directors have unloaded $28 million in stock. All right, so we're now gonna take a more detailed look at some of the allegations from Hindenburg Research here, some of their findings, etc. And keep in mind, guys, Hindenburg have disclosed they are short Lordstown Motors stock. FYI, I'm neither long nor short Lordstown, and honestly, I don't see myself ever being long or short any of these EV SPACs as well. I wanna stay as far away from steaming piles of shit as I possibly can, lest I get a little feces on myself. I am the great mighty poo, and I'm going to throw my shit at you. Okay, this video took a rather strange turn, didn't it? But hopefully having seen that, you guys will now better be able to visualize what you're actually looking at when you examine the next EV SPAC that has no products, no revenue, no customers, and nothing but a bunch of hot air. Our research has revealed that Lordstown's order book consists of fake or entirely non-binding orders from customers that generally do not even have fleets of vehicles. According to former employees and business partners, CEO Steve Burns sought to book orders, regardless of quality, purely as a tool to raise capital and confer legitimacy. Sounds very familiar. In addition, we show how, in desperation to claim there was demand for the proposed vehicle, he paid for customers to book valueless, non-binding pre-orders. So, I've got to jump in here. Let's just think about this for a moment. If you have a product worth pre-ordering that people are interested in, generally speaking, the way that it works is they will pay you a small deposit and go, hey, I'm interested in this vehicle, here's some money on the line to prove that I'm committed to this pre-order. Think about it. If you have to pay your customers to take on board non-binding reservations, something's not quite right there. I, I, I don't know. Like, Just imagine you decided to visit your favorite lady of the night. Uh, probably not your mum. I mean somebody as a customer because yeah, yeah anyway so let's just imagine you decide to visit your favorite lady of the night as a customer and you turn up to candice and she says hey Stephen, how are you doing just the usual just clean the pipes for you and i say yes no problem that would be great so then candice says hey Stephen, cool um how much do i need to pay you for the privilege of playing your skin flute please tell me how much i would love to pay you for this wonderful privilege i know that's a pretty tasteless example here but i'm really trying to drive the point home of how ridiculous the idea of paying customers for non-binding pre-orders is. We also show for the first time the actual Lordstown pre-order agreements which we receive from former business partners. While the agreements entail zero commitment on the part of the buyer, they include clauses about the parties agreeing to work on press releases to announce the deals. Um, what? God damn it guys, why, why don't I plan my videos better? I just, that analogy about Candace the pipe cleaner, totally inappropriate, yet we're gonna keep rolling with it because it's already out there in the open. So to take that one step further, just imagine Candace the pipe cleaner who's already having such a wonderful time that she's paying me for the privilege of dining on some D, decides, you know what, this is such an amazing experience, the fact that I'm paying you to do, uh, you know what, Stephen, we should agree to tell everybody about this and what a wonderful time I'm having so they can also have the same wonderful time. What do you think? I think it's a great idea. Now, I know this. Um, that's the last time I'm bringing this analogy up. I'm sorry, guys, it just it came out. What are you going to do with it? Let's just roll with it. But the point remains, this is highly suspicious. Just think about, the, like, think about this, okay? Paying customers for pre-orders, that's backwards. Allowing customers to back out of the pre-order, so it's a non-binding pre-order. Okay, cool, whatever. But then having a clause where you need to actually promote the fact that the pre-order happened, despite the fact that it's non-binding, everything is completely backwards here. Red flags for days. On the supply side, we have found that Lordstown CEO, Steve Burns, has led the company through dubious ethical territory, typing unvetted technology and unrealistic production timelines. Once again, shout out to Trevor Milton and Nicola Motor Corporation. Based on our conversations with former employees, the company has made extensive changes to the endurance prototypes and hasn't begun the needed testing and validation for the reworked vehicle. While the company has been promoting a September 2021 production timeframe, former employees estimate the truck is three to four years away from production if it ever gets there. We also provide new details about a disastrous recent road test in which Lordstown's director of powertrain was forced to call 911 after the 2021 Lordstown Endurance he was driving spontaneously combusted and became fully engulfed in flames just 10 minutes after taking to the road. 
The truck had cleared internal testing, and this was the Endurance's very first road test. So, not a great start, but hey, you know, mistakes happen along the way. Let's not hate too much here. All right, guys, so I'm going to power through this report a little bit quicker now. Just look at some of the key highlights. Once again, don't forget, there's a link in the description to the full research report from Hindenburg. I highly recommend you guys check it out. We're just going to cover a few highlights. Otherwise, this video will be about 420 hours long, probably a little bit more than most of your attention spans can handle. Lordstown founder and CEO Steve Burns was described to us by former senior employees employees as a con man and a PT Barnum figure. Multiple former senior employees who had worked closely with Burns openly described him as a con man and a PT Barnum figure, referring to the famous showman and circus operator known for promoting hoaxes. Certainly not a good look. One senior employee told us that, while working with Steve for a couple of years, they saw more questionable and unethical business practices than they had seen over their entire career. Now, of course, this is just a comment from one person. Maybe they're making it up. That's fine. None of these particular points in this report is a smoking gun. However, viewed in aggregate, it's not a pretty picture. A huge supply of tish comes from my chocolate starfish. How about some scat, you little twat? Burns was pushed out of workhorse by the board due to his inability to focus and execute projects, according to former employees. So there's a little bit of a background here for those of you that don't quite know. Workhorse and Lordstown are separate companies. Lordstown Motors has a licensing agreement with Workhorse to license a lot of the technology in the Lordstown pickup truck. And in addition to that, Workhorse received a 10% stake in Lordstown Motors as part of this arrangement. So it's almost like the pickup truck, Workhorse like, yeah, fuck it, we're not going to build a pickup truck. Next minute, old mate Steve starts this company, Lordstown, suddenly goes, hey guys, let's license the tech, you'll get a stake in the company, and basically continues on with that project that Workhorse decided to abandon, roughly speaking. Lordstown's order book looks to be almost entirely fake and or non-binding, representing no genuine demand. Lordstown has consistently claimed that its large order book is a key investment highlight underscoring deep demand for the company's products which have yet to be produced or sold. Exactly the same shite that Trevor Milton of Nicola pulled. Hey, refuse trucks, yeah, garbage trucks, yeah, we've got 4 billion pre-orders worth $22 trillion in these garbage trucks. Next minute the garbage trucks cancelled. 20 other examples of that as well. The exact same playbook. Hey, look at us, lots of non-binding pre-orders. There's huge demand for our products. Please invest in our company, you dumb retail investors and you dumb venture capitalists. Thank you. You know what would be great? Hearing it straight from the horse's mouth. Over to you, Steve Burns, founder and CEO of Lordstown Motors. Please tell us about these extremely legitimate pre-orders that you happen to have that you definitely didn't pay people for, etc. We've already sold. So normally you do not start the sales process until today. When you can drive the vehicle on the stage, and people can see it, get a feel for it, drive it, understands its presence, its, its use case. But we, we didn't have that luxury. We had to know a little early, before we bought this or before we got too deep into this, would fleets buy an electric pickup truck from a new unknown startup OEM? So we started pre-selling. And I think we have, we, we have our whole year, our first year of production already pre-sold. We got 27,000 orders. We got customers really, really wanting the truck. Well, we sell to commercial fleets. That's our first customer. And like you said, we've already got 50,000 pre-orders. And it seems as if uh, some of these orders, the 50,000, are from solid, a Duke Energy, a First Energy. These people are not going to be walking away. They are committed. Right. Yeah. All of them. You know, when you order, I think our average order size is about 500 trucks at a time. And, you know, as... as most of them are signed by the CEOs of these large firms. And, you know, bringing in 500 electric vehicles into your fleet is not trivial. So you got to plan all the charging and everything. So very serious orders. Well, it's been absolutely crazy just following along in all honesty. So I remember that I think the first number we had from you guys was when the initial investor presentation came out with something around to like 28,000. And then I remember it just kept going up and up <laughs> and up. And it, it was just, it was immense. Yeah. Yeah, it's, um, and again, all those numbers are just commercial fleets. Yeah. It doesn't count, you know, a, a municipality, a state vehicles, federal vehicles, military vehicles, all those folks use a lot of pickup trucks. And most of them use them in a, a, a local, you know, fashion. Yeah. So the, the, the range is perfect for them. So they can't do pre-orders, just, you know, they're government entities. So that 100,000 that we've announced doesn't even count all that. And we have pre-sold uh, 100,000 of these to, to various fleets across America. So really 
big appetite. I don't know about you guys, but I tend to get the impression there from those clips that the CEO of Lordstown Motors really wants people to know about their now 100,000 strong pre-order book. Of course, no mention that they're non-binding, that they paid for some of these. Nah, no, forget about that. Just, just Let's just ignore that. We've got lots of orders, and that doesn't even include pre-orders from the governments because they're not allowed to pre-order. Man, there's a lot of demand. Hey, dumbass, would you like to invest in our company now? Okay, and back to these wonderful pre-orders and reservations. Let's just read a few points according to Hindenburg's research. They are non-binding letters of intent require a $0 reservation as payment, do not require an actual purchase, are from customers that generally do not operate fleets, red flag of the fucking century, are from customers that often do not have the means to make the purchases, aka a couple of people in a tiny little office ordering $50 million of trucks, you know, those kind of discrepancies. Include a clause encouraging a press release to announce the deal, which just is bananas. Let's continue. Lordstown's S1 filing discusses the non-binding nature of its pre-order book, good, but does not disclaim any risks associated with whether or not such businesses even have the means to make such purchases. Insane. Or whether the businesses would have any credible demand for vehicles. These pre-orders are smelling more and more fake by the minute. Typically, the goal behind generating pre-orders is to capture actual product demand, but a Lordstown partner that helped generate pre-orders acknowledged that the goal was to boost investor confidence in order to raise capital. Fundraising was directly linked to pre-order generation. The faster the pre-orders arrived, the greater the investor's confidence would be in the company and the faster funds would flow in. Does anyone remember Trevor Milton talking about that Nicola Badger, the gravy train, the retail investors, the Robin Hood crowd? Do you guys remember that? Same fucking playbook. What I did is I knew day one, you know, once once we started coming out, we had all this gravy train coming in from the semi-truck program. My, my question was, okay, that's great, but I'll never touch the average consumer. So therefore, 90% of investors will probably never invest in me. So I needed to touch the consumer. And so the, the truck is for the profit the semi truck, the pickup trucks for the consumer and the consumer is the one who is part of the Robin hood portfolio is part of the, the, Got you it. know, the family office or whatever. And that's where all the, the valuation of the company comes from. Lordstown by contrast has resorted at times to paying for non-binding pre-orders, then using the fictitious demand to fuel financing rounds and to confer an aura of credibility on the company. Now, I don't know about you guys, but if I had a company and I was paying customers using the term fairly loosely there because again these aren't actually binding reservations if i had to pay customers to make non-binding reservations for my non-existent product i'd be a little bit dubious and concerned that maybe the entire company itself was a gigantic singing piece of shit do you really think you'll survive in here you don't seem to know which creek you're in now we get into some of the juicy details. E Squared Energy, a $735 million deal for 14,000 trucks from an entity run out of a small apartment in Texas. On December 24, 2020, Lordstown announced a massive 14,000 truck deal with E Squared Energy, representing almost 17.5% of its 80,000 total pre orders at the time. Given the proposed base price of $52,500, the deal represents $735 million in demand. Given the size of the order, one might imagine E Squared to be a large enterprise with ample assets. So, uh, spoiler alert, a little bit of digging, it turns out that the company behind this is registered as an individual doing business as another name. Keep digging, it turns out that the address is registered for a small apartment in Texas. Just for the record, this is common practice. Some business owners, myself included, have business addresses that aren't actually where the business operates from. It may be a smaller office, it may be a residential building, so this isn't the be all and end all. But again, you do some digging and you turn out this company that's like reserved like three quarters of a billion dollars worth of trucks, has two employees and has a residential address in a small apartment building in Texas that appears to be the same residential address as the founder of the company, which is one of its two employees. So smells a bit fishy. But wait, there's more. Innovations LLC, a $52.5 million, 1,000 truck order from a two-person startup with no apparent assets based out of a Regis virtual office. Wait, you're telling me another massive order in the tens or hundreds of millions of dollars from another company that has just two employees? The Florida entity that was formed about four months prior to the announcement of the pre-orders, according to Florida corporate records. The entity lists its main office address as a Regis virtual office and its mailing address as a UPS store in Florida. So I'm not even going to expand on this. 
Smells fishy. And even more damning here, a quote from the innovation CEO who acknowledges that they have no plans to actually purchase the vehicles. And here's a little bit more about the paying for pre-orders and reservations. Lordstown predecessor under Steve Burns' leadership struggled to find enough orders so it began paying $30 per non-binding order as early as 2016. Per a lawsuit filed by one such consultant, the company was paying $30 per each, no commitment, zero money down, non-binding, letter of intent, aka orders. Lordstown's Macquarie Rider and Duke Energy orders for 2,500 and 500 trucks were mere favours to the CEO, according to former employees. Production over promises and tech issues. The Endurance and its predecessor have consistently been beset with delays. Burns has been laid on production promises by three years and counting. Burns has distinguished himself by consistently promising very near-term mass production, often within 6 to 12 months, then repeatedly missing those targets. In May 2017, the truck was said to be ready for production in early 2018. By late 2017 slash early 2018, the truck was said to be ready for production and sale to customers by Q4 2018. By the way guys, uh, I don't know if you know this, but it's, it's 2021 as I'm recording this. Fully engulfed, the Lordstown Endurance prototype spontaneously burst into flame 10 minutes into its first road test in January 2021. Now as I said, I don't want to sh on the company too much here. These kind of things can happen. That's why you do testing, but it kind of matters. Let's scroll down to see why. Here are some actual images of the vehicle on fire. As you can see, relatively serious. Now again, these things happen. That's not the issue. This is the issue. Two weeks after its very first endurance test truck burst into flames, Lordstown announced that it would begin building beta trucks in a month. When asked about the immolation of its test vehicle, Lordstown acknowledged about a month later very suspect, about a month later that it did have an event stating that we do not generally comment on individual testing conditions. Now, in my opinion, this is one of the biggest fucking red flags of all. If you have an issue like this, you're a new company, people will know you're going to have issues. Don't try to cover it up, deceive, delay mentioning it. Oh yeah, we don't talk about it. Go fuck yourself, okay? This isn't an incident. It is a catastrophe, a massive setback. Now, I don't have issues with this vehicle bursting into flames within 10 minutes of getting on roads. I mean, that sucks, rip Lordstown Motors, but hey, that's why you do testing. But here's the issue. The fact that Lordstown Motors delay mentioning this, then a two weeks later after this vehicle self-immolates within 10 minutes of getting onto public roads for the first time, Lordstown Motor reiterate that they're about to produce beta vehicles like nothing happened. Not cool. Obviously, this is a huge setback. Obviously, Lordstown weren't expecting their very first vehicle within 10 minutes of getting on a public road to be in flames. That's what happened. Obviously, there's a setback. Obviously, there's going to be some delays here. Yep, Lordstown don't say a word. This is why I really start to mistrust the things this company is saying, or in this case, isn't saying. Sweet corn is the only thing that makes it through my rear. How do you think I keep this lovely grin? You guys thought we were done with red flags? Hell no. Lordstown Hub Motor Technology, core to its vehicle success, is licensed from a tiny Slovenian company that former employees said Burns went with because it was cheap. <laughs> Always a good sign, isn't it? The technology is licensed from Elefi, a small company based in Slovenia that has raised only 15.3 million euros in funding in its 15-year history, according to Crunchbase. Hub Motor Technology has never been commercialized at scale in the light vehicle market, posing major technical challenges, according to analysts and industry experts. Lordstown's claim production target, September 2021, just a few months away. Former employee, maybe three to four years, if ever. Drastic recent changes have been made to prototypes and none of the testing and validation has been completed. For example, in mid-January, the company totally switched from a plastic exterior to aluminium in order to reduce weight. The former employee called the change drastic and suggested that the entirely new frames would essentially restart any testing and validation process. The former employee also explained that Lordstown had not completed any of its required testing and validation. Translation, they are a very long way away from volume production, despite what they're telling you. <laughs> September 2021, good fucking luck with that. Steve Burns, we will make all battery packs in-house. Former employee, there's no battery pack manufacturing equipment on site there now. They just put it together by hand. You guys remember Trevor Milton, everything in-house? We won't go there, let's move on. Steve Burns has told investors that batteries are the secret source of an electric OEM. 
by the way, he's actually right, like in part anyway, it's a major, major component, having battery technology, it's not just the cells, the packs, none of that, it also includes thermal management and many other things as well. So he's right on that point, it's extremely important to have great battery technology. Yet despite spending a decade in the EV industry, neither Lordstown or Workhorse has any battery specific patents to show for it. Gee whiz, no patents at all to do with batteries. Hmm, interesting. Despite this, Burns has claimed that Lordstown's battery packs are better than what Tesla can currently produce. Didn't Trevor Milton say the exact same thing that they had better battery tech than Tesla? Oh my god, this, this is just... It's the same f***ing playbook. Steve Burns. We will license the motor technology and produce the motors in-house. Former employee. They're buying them direct from the production source. And here's a real juicy one. Lordstown was sued over allegations that it faked interest in licensing third-party infotainment software, then poached the company's employees and stole its designs instead. I mean, you can't even make this shit up. Lordstown has very little intellectual property of its own and generally licenses outside technology or outsources key components. Sounds so damn familiar, doesn't it? Nicola all over again. A lawsuit by Karma Automotive, a California electric vehicle maker, alleges in detail how Lordstown entered into an NDA to perform due diligence on licensing Karma's infotainment system, then stole the technology instead. I mean, Jesus, this is so shady. Of course, these are just allegations that have made their way to a court of law. Just saying. The complaint contains emails showing how Lordstown secretly hired employees of Karma, sometimes while they were still employed at the firm. Karma alleges that Lordstown then encouraged the duplicitous employees to steal thousands of documents via USB flash drive, which they used to launch a new Lordstown, California office focused on building the infotainment system in-house. It gets even better, folks. The lawsuit shows that Lordstown accidentally emailed the supplier a cost-benefit analysis. <laughs> f*** me. <laughs> I gotta start again. The lawsuit shows that Lordstown accidentally emailed the supplier a cost-benefit analysis of licensing the technology legitimately versus stealing it and poaching the employees instead. I mean, oh, this is, you can't make this stuff up. Lordstown apparently made its intentions extremely obvious when it accidentally emailed one of the poached Karma employees on its work email with a cost-benefit analysis of licensing the technology from Karma versus misappropriating it and setting up a new Lordstown, California office instead. Aside from the potential liability associated with the complaint, it underscores an approach to business that is similarly unethical and sloppy. Huge red flags. If Lordstown is comfortable misappropriating technology through obvious acts of deception, should investors think themselves spared from the same fate? I'm going to jump in here and answer that. No, but the bell curve is real and there will be some investors that are actually dumb enough to actually not connect the dots and think, yeah, you know what, that's not a red flag. I love this company. All in on Lordstown Motors. The lack of a single product sale hasn't stopped insiders from selling around $28 million in stock in four months through open market sales. Once again, Selling stock before any products have been delivered to customers, huge red flag. Didn't Trevor Milton do that one as well? You know, sell stock, buy the big... Uh, yeah, let's just move on. The prototype fire took place on January 13th, but was only revealed publicly on February 10th. Lordstown executives sold $8.8 .8 million in stock through open market sales in that time frame before the public knew about the fire. This, guys, is a massive f***ing red flag. Well, guys, congratulations for making it this far through my longest ever YouTube video. Your reward? We're going to now look at some questions Hindenburg have posed to Lordstown Motors. Conclusion. Investors, workers, and the local community deserve answers on what is going on at Lordstown. We don't think Lordstown Motors has been transparent. These questions are an opportunity to clear the air and show the local community, investors, and the public that the hope placed in Steve Burns has been justified. Lordstown announced a $14,000 truck order from E Squared Energy, representing $735 million in potential sales. We found that E Squared is based out of a small apartment in Texas that doesn't operate a fleet. How do you explain this? And how do you explain calling this a pre-order when there is no end customer? Lordstown announced a 52.5 million, 1,000 truck order from Innovations LLC. We found that the entity is based out of a Regis virtual office with a UPS store mailbox. The CEO of the apparently two-man operation described his role as being that of a promoter. 
How do you explain this? And how do you explain calling this a pre-order when there is no end customer? When we contacted the CEO of a supposed key customer, GridX, he had no idea the company was considered a customer of Lordstown. Can you explain who at GridX signed the agreement apparently without the knowledge of GridX senior management? Does Lordstown have any binding commitments or deposits from customers to purchase any trucks? If so, how many, how much? Just jumping in here so far, these are pretty reasonable questions if you ask me. What percentage of your pre-order book is from customers that don't operate fleets? Why was Lordstown paying $30 to $50 to collect non-binding pre-orders of virtually no substance? Really good question. Lordstown marketing partner explained that fundraising was directly linked to pre-order generation in order to increase investor confidence. How do you respond? Lordstown and predecessor Workhorse have previously claimed to be 6 to 12 months away from production targets for years. Why should investors believe this time will be different? The police report describing the immolation of the first Lordstown test vehicle stated that the model had passed all internal testing before being taken on the road. If that is the case, why did the vehicle incinerate itself within 10 minutes of being driven on actual roads? Why did Lordstown license its critical motor technology from a tiny Slovenian company, Elefi? Have the motors ever been successfully implemented on any commercial trucks currently in production or driven by end customers? Former employees described that Lordstown has completed no major testing and validation of the prototypes. What progress has Lordstown made on cold weather testing? How about a million mile test or similar durability testing? How many miles of actual road testing has Lordstown completed to date? A former employee explained that Lordstown hasn't completed any Federal Motor Vehicle Safety Standards tests required by NHTSA. How do you respond? Have these tests begun and will you provide thorough details on progress to date? A former employee stated that Lordstown switched from plastic frames to aluminium frames early this year, a drastic change that would essentially reset any testing or validation. Did this change happen? And if so, did you expect this wouldn't affect testing and production timelines? The company has said previously that it would make all battery packs in-house. A former employee said the equipment to manufacture battery packs is months away from arrival and that the battery packs are currently being made by hand. How do you respond? Karma Automotive sued Lordstown, alleging the company poached its employees and proprietary infotainment system. The lawsuit includes an email sent by Lordstown showing a cost-benefit analysis of misappropriating the capabilities versus licensing them. How do you respond? Former employees have said that Lordstown is three to four years away from production, if ever. Aside from a high-level goal, will you provide a clear timeline of steps needed to get the endurance to production by September from a testing, validation and factory tooling perspective? Finally, why have insiders sold $28 million in stock despite there being no product and the company claiming to be on the cusp of full production? Some great questions posed by Hindenburg Research to Lordstown Motors. Now, the last time I recall this happening, Hindenburg had a lot of questions for Nikola Motor Corporation. Nikola Motor Corporation came back saying, yeah, we're going to respond to these comments real soon. Next minute, the founder and executive chairman voluntarily leaves the company. Next minute, the Department of Justice and SEC is investigating both the company and Trevor Milton. Next minute, in a Nikola K-10 filing with the SEC, they literally admit that a bunch of the stuff they're accused of by Hindenburg Research was correct, factual. Yes, they lied to investors, misled, etc. It's going to be an absolute train wreck. This thing is still playing out. So, Lordstown Motors, do you guys have anything to say? Does anyone want to speak up? Do you have anything, any response to these comments, these questions? You do? Great, take it away, Lordstown Motors. Now I'm really getting rather mad or like a niggly, tickly, shitty little tag nut. When I've knocked you out with all my bab, I'm going to take your head and ram it off my butt. Your butt. My butt. Your butt. That's right, my butt. Ugh. My butt. Ugh. My butt. So there is actually method to my madness. In this report, Hindenburg have asked some great questions. Maybe, just maybe, Lordstown Motors will have legitimate, reasonable answers to every single one. But I have my doubts. I have a high suspicion that this company will never reach volume production. Insiders will continue selling stock, pushing out the timeline production on oh, another six months, then six months later, oh, another six months, and nothing actually gets produced. But I would love to be wrong. As for the gigantic singing pile of shit, Hopefully the arrow helped give you guys a little bit of a clue. I see this as a personification, no, personification of a typical EV SPAC startup. Basically, a sweet talking gigantic pile of shit. Now, some of these companies maybe will eventually make it to volume production. 
but the odds are heavily stacked against them. And when you see companies hiding, failing to reveal, lacking transparency, or doing extremely shady business practices, stealing IP, these kind of things, or touting their enormous book of reservations when none of them are binding and they've been paying to get these reservations, run the other fucking way. If you're the kind of investor that's willing to invest in an EV SPAC startup based on dubious reservations, these kind of things, and no real tangible data, no obvious technological advantage, no products being delivered to customers, etc., I'm willing to bet that either you have your head up your own ass or the EV SPAC startup has shoved your head up their ass. Invest with caution. I'm Stephen Mark Ryan. This is Solving the Money Problem, and I love you all. And don't forget, if you'd like to help out the channel and get up to two free stocks, check out the link in the description to Webull. If you open a new account, you'll get one free stock valued up to $250 just for opening an account. And if you fund your account with $100, you'll get a second free stock valued up to $1,600. And if you're in Australia, the UK or New Zealand, you can get a free stock with stake also using the link in the description. Thanks so much for watching. Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. And of course, if you have any ideas for future videos, let me know. I read all your comments. Comments. P.S. If you're still watching, you're awesome. If you'd like early access, exclusive videos, regular Q&As, our private Discord server and more, consider supporting the channel at patreon.com slash solving the money problem so I can keep creating content for you guys. There's a link in the description. You can now also become a member of the channel for some exclusive perks. To learn more, click the join button next to subscribe and don't forget to check out our merch store. Either way, the best form of support is you being here and watching so thanks again.